Hi! So, uh, this time the video is going to be slightly different. Um, basically, it's going to be a discussion video on a short story. And it's a collaboration between me and the channel, Sean the Book Maniac. And um, we're going to discuss the short story by Filipino author Karima Pulotan Tuvera. And I hope you enjoy. So, cue the transition. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Hi, my name is Freddy, and I'm from Sluggish Reader, and I'm a new Booktuber. Hello, Freddy. How are you doing? I am doing great. It's the weekend, so of course, it's always great in weekends. How about you? It's raining outside, but otherwise, I'm having a good day. I'm collaborating with Freddy of Sluggish Reader for the purpose of a series of discussion videos that I'm doing to mark the Asian Readathon month, in which I and another booktuber or bookish person read the same short story penned by an Asian author and discuss it. And so we are here today for that purpose. And the story that we have both read is from the Philippines. It is called The Virgin by Karima Politan Tuvera. It is available online. I will put a link in the show notes. Freddie and I are not going to worry about spoilers. This is a story that was, I think, published maybe in the 1950s. It's just a short story that will take you 15 to 20 minutes to read. If you don't want any spoilers, the simple solution is read the story and come back. Because we're just not going to worry about that. We're going to do a kind of a deep dive discussion about it. And if you're allergic to spoilers, read the story first. Freddie, why don't you get us started? What did you think of this story? So... When I just started reading the story, I actually felt that it's, it was a bit slow. The characters are pretty limited. There aren't a lot of characters in this story. Basically, it's about one woman who goes by the name of Miss Miharis. She is at her 30s. Um, she has never been in a relationship before. And she is not the most friendliest person ever. And so if I were to be with her, I wouldn't be super comfortable with her as well because she always looked like this stern person kind of condescending to the people around her Definitely. and so she works at the placement agency and it was there that she meets people who comes looking for work and one day she meets this guy you said that it started out slow your mm -hmm. overall impression did you like it or not it actually i would say that it's slow overall throughout the story but it doesn't mean that i don't like it in fact a lot of the things that i read that i like are in fact slow and this this one is the the, the strong point is actually coming from the characterization of the main character miss miharis herself and we see the kinds of changes that she demonstrates in this short story I thought it was a really good study, a character study. Her character was layered and I thought that was well done. I ultimately didn't love this story. I, there were things about it that I quite liked, but I didn't think that it necessarily came together. It seems to be a canonical story within the Filipino literature. 1952 is when it was published. It really draws on the, I don't like this word, but the trope the cliche of the old maid, Miss Mijaris, is that how you're pronouncing it? You know what? I am actually not 100% sure. I'm not either. <laughs> but it probably has a Spanish pronunciation, so, so probably Mijaris. Mijaris, <laughs> okay. Well, let's go with that. Miss Mijaris, she's only 34, but she is written and described as if she is dried up and her marrying days are finished. And I think that the writer focuses a lot on her appearance in a way that is meant to accentuate the fact that she is not a beautiful, nubile young woman anymore. And I don't know that I was ultimately so comfortable with that. I guess I give more of a benefit of the doubt when the author was herself a female writer. But yeah, it was really kind of, just in case anybody missed it, she circled around about 18 times about how unattractive and old looking uh, Miss Mahari's was. Yeah, I definitely noticed that there is a lot of description on her appearance on how she's not very attractive, but at the same time, not super ugly as well. Right. And I think it's kind of interesting that it seems like 
at least from my experience, many times when people talk about how a woman is, um, a woman's status as a virgin and, you know, related to her age, I think it's kind of inevitable that they would relate it with her appearance as well. Because it seems like a lot of people have this impression that women who have not gotten married at such an age is probably not going to be the kind of woman that would look beautiful. There is a polarity between her as a potential wife and having kind of missed that train, that, that ship has sailed, and the fact that she's a career woman mm. in a way that very much shows that it was written at that time in 1950s. It just feels like she made a choice or she made the best of a set of circumstances, but the fact that she is quote unquote married to her job, that is part of the reason why she's single. Do you feel that the author has some sort of opinion on on the fact that she is so-called married to the job? Like, uh, do you think that the author has a negative or positive opinion on that? I hesitate to ascribe too much to the author's opinion. I just feel there isn't much room in the story for her to, like, she's certainly not fulfilled by her job. She is secretly under all the layers of her clothing, and I want to talk about her clothing, and uh, what she hides in her deepest self. She is craving love. She is shriveled up with the absence of love. But it just felt very much of a of its age, that there wasn't a way for her to be filled in any other way other than to receive the love of a man. Have you read much Philippine literature? I haven't. No, personally, I've not read any. All of the works of this writer, Karima Politan Tuvera, seem to be out of print. She is known as the mother of Filipina literature. She died in 2011, I think. Mm, yeah, in her 80s. And this story is everywhere online. And what I found, and I'm feeling kind of embarrassed for her and her legacy, that this is the only way that you can read the story, but there are at least a half a dozen transcription errors, spelling mistakes, uh, words missing. There's about a half dozen, more at the end than at the beginning. But there's no other way to access the story. So that makes me feel uncomfortable. But it, I think it's still a work of literature worth reading and discussing. But her works are completely out of print. You have better luck finding her in databases like bookstore databases, Amazon or uh, whatever you use, Abe Books. If you take off her second surname, Tuvera, Karima Politan brings up more results than Karima Politan Tuvera in the book store searches, but everything is either out of print. I think I found one copy of her collected short stories that's for sale for $400. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to buy it. She was really an interesting person though, because she and her husband were very, very closely associated with the Marcuses during that, how many decades long dictatorship of now, what was his name? Imelda is the wife, but what was his name? Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. Her husband was a speechwriter for Marcos, and she lived kind of in that circle. You're way too young, but I'm old enough that I remember when the Marcos regime fell, and the joke for years afterwards was about how many pair of shoes Imelda had. <laughs> like thousands of pairs of shoes. She was just a, a queen. I think they went into exile to, was it Hawaii? Then the Philippines became a democracy. I mean, it was a bit rough going in the early years, but they basically have been, and now they have Duterte, who's just a horrible, he's basically a dictator in so many ways. But it seems like her literary reputation did not suffer in the post-Marcos democracy era. She was fated and memorialized a lot at her death, according to what I found online. But I think actually find her life story more interesting maybe than this story, than this short story. But this short story seems to be at the center of the Philippine literary tradition. Yeah. When I search for this story, I find several online copies of it, all with the mm -hmm. same spelling mistakes and stuff. Like I couldn't find a clean one. And then dozens and dozens of student essays on this story that are publicly available. And none of them are very good. I mean, they're high school essays or first year English essays. 
Now she married and she had 10 children. So her life took a very different direction in many ways than Miss Mahari's. So what did you think of the ending? Did it have I a happy ending or not? The ending is, I would judge it as happy because it's a little bit ambiguous, but at least uh, as far as the character goes, it shows some change in her that she decides to uh, take some agency and decides to do something for herself. Uh, so that's what I like about it. Actually, we only see that in a very short bit at the end. Yes. I think it's just for the, the last sentence that it really shows that change in Miss Niharis. So to, to set it up, and again, we're not worrying about spoilers because you should have, if you're this far into the video, people, you should have read the story by now. But uh, she's taking the bus, they're called jeepneys, a peculiar Filipino type of bus, very colorful. We'll put some pictures up on the screen there because they're quite uh, intriguing looking buses. And she's gone home in the rain and that man, Freddie, is he named? I don't think his name. I, the man in the story is a man that comes to her. She works at, what would you call it? I think it was a labor placement agency. Placement agency. And uh, she places him doing some carpentry work. And yeah. she's very attracted to him. He comes from a much lower class. She tries to help him out. And there's a moment of chilling cruelty when he tells her, that he had been off the job for a week because his son had died and she is so angry that he never told her he was married and he said, I wasn't married to my son's mother and she doesn't show any sympathy for the death of the son. That's one of the moments of the story that I will never forget. I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's just <laughs> jarring. <laughs> jarring is the perfect word. And then she gets on this bus and she's had some bad dreams about the bus and he gets on the bus. The bus driver, as apparently is the custom or is often happens, refused to take them down the main road at a certain point in a rainstorm and tells them to get off on the side street. So there they are in the pouring rain and he apologizes again for the uh, implication that he had lied to her. Then this, I must get away, she thought wildly, but he had moved and brushed against her and where his touch had fallen, her flesh leaped and she recalled how his hands had looked that first day laying tenderly at the edge of her desk and about the wooden bird that had looked like a moving, shining dove. And she turned to him with her ruffles wet and wilted. In the dark, she turned to him. So, yeah, definitely it's open to interpretation. She turned to him, so we assume that they fell in love or lived happily Maybe. ever after. But it very much follows a very traditional romance plot that I wasn't sure completely w worked for me. I was intrigued by all the references to her clothing and the various words that were used to show how she wore, because she was skin and bones. She was a very, very slim woman with not much of a figure, flat chested and so on, but that she wore her clothes to kind of give herself a, a bit of a figure. And so she would wear clothes that were ruffled. And I thought that the writer was up to something with the many frequent references to all that. I think that with her clothes and her clothing choices and the fact that she is actually a woman who focuses more on her job, I think there's definitely a lot of hints in probably how she feels insecure about herself. Sure. Because she knows she wants something, but she's probably not sure about yeah. it. This one sentence near the beginning, she liked poofs and shearings and little girlish pastel colors. So shearing was a new word to me, a noun that comes from the verb shear, S-H-I-R-R, -R, which I had never heard of. Something that is really technical to sewing. <laughs> That's right. So the verb means shear, means uh, to gather an area of fabric or part of, gar of a garment by means of drawn or elasticized threads in parallel rows. She wears that Type, those types of garments to kind of give herself a bit of a kind of to fluff herself up to give her a bit of a bust or whatever a bit of a curves on, on the lower half of her body if I could say it any more awkwardly and, and then that last sentence which we read her ruffles on her skirt which again is pr pretty much the same thing are wet and she turns and looks at him. I think that things like pleats and ruffles and shirrings 
on an outfit is actually a little bit over the top. Yep. Yeah. Because um, those things definitely have a lot of wrinkles, but it it does not really show. I wouldn't really associate those things with someone who wants to look powerful or authoritative or someone who is um, really confident with themselves. You are right. And little girlish pastel colors. So definitely she is a somewhat older. 34 is not old. I mean, probably 34 seems old to you, Freddie, but it doesn't seem old to me. But she is portrayed as being, you know, past her prime and all that. But at, at the same time, like you just said, there's something a little girlish about the choices she's making fashion wise. At that time, 34 is probably something, uh, an age in which they would have passed the time to get married. 34 was the old 50, I guess. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that she wants to present herself with all of these uh, features in the clothes and, and, and the pastel colors that, that are supposedly girly, but then again, she's already 30-something. When she was younger, it, it was mentioned in the story that she, she had never had a relationship when she was young. And she actually spent a lot of time taking care of her family yeah. when she was younger. So I think it may mean that you know, when she was young, she didn't really get to express herself in terms of these kinds of outfit or in express herself. So another way to look at the ending is that she may have turned to him and he may not have been interested in her as anything other than the fact that she had been kind to him as his superior, as his boss, quote unquote, and he had no romantic interest in her. He kind of viewed her as a sexless old ant figure. I actually found that there were a few things that were a little bit on the nose with this book. I know that it's trying to play around with a lot of symbols. Yes. And I think that symbols are great. Metaphors are great. They are wonderful. But um, I don't know if you noticed that in the, the bits where they were talking about the paperweight. I did. Please tell me what you thought of that. So she had this paperweight that looked ugly and the bird probably didn't look like, look like a bird and it was it was just overall a, a bad looking paperweight but then when the man came and the paperweight I think the screw was loose and the man came to her counter at the time and he fixed this paperweight and suddenly she perceives this paperweight as something that looked beautiful like I mean the, the guy just screwed the, the the bird in and then maybe wiped it a little bit, dusted it a little bit, and it was described as something that looked like a dove. And I think that's, I don't know. <laughs> I think the author is trying to get to something, how Miss Miharis is, is experiencing this whole visit of the man to her. And probably it implies that there is something happening emotionally with her mm. to the extent that she views that paperweight you know, completely different from how it was before. And did that work for you? Not exactly. Okay, yeah, no, me, I, I thought it was really heavy handed. Yeah, I think uh, it was really blatant. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of symbols. I like to find my own symbols. That's why to me, the, the ruffling of the thing was much more subtle. And I kind of did, focused on that. That paperweight thing just kind of made my skin crawl. <laughs> it just jumped off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. That was one of the things that I really didn't care for. It was just a few lines in the story, but it's, it just comes off as really, she was really slathering the symbolism on. All right, well, this has been fun. Thank you very much, Freddie. Thank you so much. Oh, and by the way, Freddie and I are also going to be doing a general chit chat about his channel, his literary interests and so on. So stay tuned for that video coming soon to our channels. And thanks for watching.